for this presentation. So similar to Dr. Cohen's presentation earlier, this is a case from a few years ago, and obviously, obviously technology has changed. We may approach a case like this differently and, and may have avoided this complication, but I think this is a, um, the, the issue of LV uh, apical pseudoaneurysms is going to become potentially an issue again uh, with evolving technologies, which I'll comment on later. So this was a 75-year-old female, severe aortic stenosis, class three heart failure, um, a pretty bad peripheral vascular disease with known uh, bilateral FEMPOP bypasses, moderate severe lung disease um, on three liters of chronic supplemental O2, diabetes, she was very frail, and a history of chronic pericarditis, and actually had pericardial stripping in the 1980s. Um, her estimated sts prom for uh, SAVR was 7%. We felt she was prohibitive risk for SAVR due to frailty and lung disease. And this was back in the days of um, original core valve and Sapien XT, uh, which obviously used larger sheaths. And so our plan at our institution at the time, we were, we were very comfortable with transapical access being a uh, VAD center, a transplant center, and doing lots of transapical cases with original Sapien. And so the original plan was a transapical TAVR with Sapien XT. Uh, annual area was about somewhere between 405 to 415. Um, STJ, 27, and sinuses were generous at 30. So the plan uh, initially was probably a 26, uh, either a 23 or 26 uh, Sapien XT, um, or one could consider a 26 or a 29 core, uh, original core valve at that time. So this was the uh, peripheral vasculature, clearly not amenable to a transfemoral approach, uh, likely not even with today's uh, technology as well. So uh, brought her in for the transapical procedure, and just this was from the uh, surgical report uh, for that index procedure, um, where essentially what was described was just by putting in the sutures, um, the stay sutures, before access was even obtained with the needle, uh, there was comment that there was a lot of bleeding, the tissue was very friable, um, couldn't get good hemostasis, and so the feeling was if we had accessed this uh, patient with, you know, an 18 or a 20 French e sheath. Uh, through the apex that um, there, there'd be a really rip, huge risk to her life in terms of not uh, obtaining hemostasis at the end of the procedure. So uh, the procedure was aborted. Uh, they put several horizontal mattress, uh, pledged mattress stitches down just to stop the bleeding and the oozing from the, uh, you know, just from the needles. Um, had sufficient hemostasis at that time, took the patient off the table, and then tried to come up with plan B, which plan B at the time was then either do a direct aortic approach with either a sapien or a uh, core valve uh, with the feeling that it was kind of borderline in terms of height, in terms of what we needed in our ascending aorta. And so we looked at the subclavian and felt that it was probably amenable to do this from the subclavian, um, left subclavian approach uh, through a conduit. It'd be, it'd be snug, but we thought we could do it um, and uh, go with the Medtronic core valve at that point in time. However, we had this not so incidental finding on that repeat CT to look at her subclavians um, where our uh, cardiac uh, radiologist called us down and said, you may want to come and see this. And we took a look at it and said, well, that's not good. So there was a pretty prominent LV apical pseudoaneurysm that had formed in the few weeks uh, since our index procedure um, coming right from the site uh, that was accessed with the needles. And it measured a neck of about three millimeters with a pseudoaneurysm uh, dimensions of 12 by 24 millimeters. So not a small pseudoaneurysm by any means. So then we went to plan C, uh, which was treat the uh, aortic stenosis first with a 29 millimeter core valve through a sheath technique from the uh, left subclavian through a, a eight millimeter surgical conduit. We would uh, prep for a, a backup bailout direct aortic approach if we couldn't get the sheath through the subclavian. And then once the uh, aortic valve was, was taken care of, then we would address the issue of the LV apical pseudoaneurysm with plans to place uh, most likely an amplots or duct occluder two uh, via a retrograde approach from the same uh, subclavian access site. So the, uh, the deployment of the Medtronic uh, core valve at the time was unremarkable, pretty straightforward procedure. It was a little tough getting the uh, 18 French sheath uh, down into where we needed to in the ascending aorta, but got it down. And, and then the uh, valve procedure overall wa was unremarkable. Nice result there. And so this was our aortogram after, or sorry, our ventricular gram after, and you can see clear flow into that uh, enlarging pseudoaneurysm sac. Looks larger on angiography than it did on CT. Um, and so we knew that that needed to get taken care of. So our approach to this was, these are just some echo measurements of it as well, kind of confirmed um, diameter of the neck of about you know, two to three um, in, a, in a fairly sizable uh, pseudoaneurysm sac. 
So our approach was to directly cannulate the LV apical pseudoaneurysm, and, and we uh, essentially did a mother, daughter, whatever you want to call it, telescoping a technique where we knew we needed a, a slightly larger bore delivery system to deliver the um, Amplatz or duct occluder, couldn't do it through a diagnostic catheter, so we took a, a 120 centimeter uh, Berenstein catheter and telescoped it through a, a, just a standard six French JR4 coronary guide in the hopes that the JR4 would give us a kind of a safe curve once we were in the pseudoaneurysm to not um, rupture the uh, outside of the sac. Uh, directed the Berenstein in, um, took a steel core wire with just kind of a floppy tip, something relatively benign, but still had some support, um, and kind of looped that in the pseudoaneurysm sac just for added support for railing catheters in. Um, and even with that, just with the five French catheter across by echo, um, we saw that there was a, a pretty marked reduction in the flow into the pseudoaneurysm by color. And so we knew that this wasn't a, a really sizable neck. It did have some length to it, but it wasn't a very wide neck, which was a good prognostic sign. Uh, and then it's hard to see on this left uh, movie, but that's our, we, you can see our JR4 kind of uh, tracking over the Berenstein catheter into the pseudoaneurysm, and then the image on the right is just the JR4 catheter in the pseudoaneurysm sac with just a, a little angiogram to confirm our location and make sure we haven't torn or ruptured um, anything, and, and at that point it looked good. So we chose a 6x6 Amplatz or duct occluder 2, um, knowing that it, it could be delivered pretty easily through this um, 6 French uh, guide. It could probably have been delivered through a 5 French guide. We just didn't have 5 French guide catheters at the time. Um, and uh, deployed it uh, into so that we tried to get the, as much of the waste into the neck of the pseudoaneurysm as we could. And so you can see that picture on the far right. Uh, we felt that the neck was uh, well, or the waste was well into the neck of the pseudoaneurysm. I uh, still see some flow through the device on that, on the uh, angiogram taken through the uh, guide catheter, but significantly reduced compared to baseline. And we felt that was a good, a good location for the device. Deployed the device, did our final angiogram, and uh, you can see there's markedly reduced flow. Uh, this essentially closed off, and by follow-up transthoracic echo, there was really no flow into this um, the next day. Here's a, a picture of just really no residual flow by color into the pseudoaneurysm sac. So just a few take-home points of this. Um, you know, obviously the frequency of entering the LV uh, via direct apical puncture for TAVR has really decreased in recent years just with the advent of, of uh, new technology, smaller sheaths, et cetera. Um, with the introduction of transcatheter mitral valve repair technologies, of which many of them are transapical and many of them use large French sheaths, uh, obviously the incidence of LV apical access is expected to rise over the next few years. Uh, the complications with LV apical access are rare. Um, but they can occur in situations where um, the myocardial tissue in that area is suboptimal. So those patients with prior chest radiation, chronic steroids, uh, cardiomyopathies, or if they just have um, very thin uh, muscle from a, you know, a, a big dilated cardiomyopathy, which a lot of the TM, TMVR patients probably will be uh, long term. Um, transcatheter repair of catheter-induced LV apical pseudoaneurysm is feasible, and it's safe to do. Um, there are things, obviously, that, you know, planning is kind of everything with these in terms of understanding the anatomy, understanding the imaging, and then most importantly, I think, understanding the equipment and knowing what devices can be delivered through what kinds of catheters, making sure the catheters are long enough depending on your approach or if you need to come transeptal, um, and then obviously what devices are the best ones to use. I think most people would argue that the vascular plugs or the ADOs are good device options because of their very tight night and all weave conformability and flexibility uh, through delivery systems. And then obviously we have some unknowns um, about you know, risk of thrombus, incidence of recurrence, what the device durability will be, um, and you know, with larger bore sheets, are, are we gonna have to consider using larger devices or multiple devices? <coughs> That's great. That's good stuff. So you're, this is an approach to fix the surgical problem uh, in, the tim in the new era. We're doing a lot of TAs for uh, mitrals. Uh, any thought to doing an upfront approach like this instead of closing primarily with sutures? Oh, and uh, on your way out, you mean? I think there's a lot of talk about that, and I know companies are designing those, those types of technologies, and I think there's a, I think it's very warranted to do, um, depending on the simplicity of it, I guess, and uh, it, I think it obviously would be better to do at the time. I mean, I think the other issue is, though, that we don't know what the incidence of this really is. It's, right. it's obviously a very low incidence. It's, it's not good when it happens. Um, so does it warrant doing it on everyone? I, I think that's a, that's a very debatable, debatable topic. Right. 
Right. Even a trickle. Mm -hmm. Right. Just from the pressure, the high pressure in the in the cavity.